Today, I'm gonna teach you how to make these badass leather pauldrons. They're easier than you think and super fun, so stay tuned. Also, make sure you stick around to the end to see what these badass costumes have to do with you in winning some fabulous prizes. Greetings, adventurers, and welcome to Skill Tree, where we learn how to do just about everything. So as I mentioned, we are going to make those awesome pauldrons, but we're also gonna use it as kind of a benchmark of how far we've come with this skill so far. As some of you may recall, I made these bad boys in this video up here like a while ago, a couple of years ago, I think. And at the time, this was the best I can do. So I wanted to take the opportunity to remake these using a lot of the skills that we've developed over those past couple of years. So let's see how we do and get right into it by leveling up this skill. Now, I quite liked this old design here. It had this kind of accordion armadillo shape to it, which was achieved by all of these strips in the back. And I've been using these in the field, like in LARPs during battles and stuff. And I can attest that that little flexibility is huge. It makes it so that I have full range of motion. It never feels like it's cutting into me. So I want to duplicate that for sure. I definitely want this upgraded version to have that. And just a heads up, I am making these templates available to you. So if you want to make this thing and follow along with, check it out in the description below. And luckily when I made this one last time, I actually saved all of the templates. So those are what I'm going to be using as the basis for what I'm making here now like i said you can check out that video how i made those templates but i'm not gonna lie to you the shape was kind of arbitrary i just thought it looked cool one of the things we are changing here though is the thickness of the leather this right here is about a six ounce leather which is like costume at best so this time around i went to tandy and got this roll of 12 ounce leather this is the beefiest stuff i've ever worked with look at the size difference compared to the six ounce next to it and I read that even like light leather armor starts around nine ounces. So we should be well into that little territory there. So with that good to go, I just place my templates onto the leather and used an awl to scratch all around the design. Then I went back in with a sharp razor and carefully cut those out. And this is for sure one of those times where what I've talked about before couldn't be more true. Always use a fresh, sharp razor when you're cutting leather, especially when it's something this thick. Even a fresh, sharp razor, I had to take a couple of passes before it actually like released from the leather. But using a dull one is super dangerous because it kind of sticks and then it pulls free and you're gonna cut yourself. Cool, once I have these all cut out, I bring on my edge beveler just to make those edges nice and clean. On oh, a heads up, if you're completely new to leather and you're like, what's an edge beveler or whatever, check out this playlist here. It's kind of my journey with leather crafting so far and a lot of these basics are covered in those earlier episodes. Okay, so for the design I'm actually gonna be going for here, our resident artist and pain in the ass bird middle Miss Red made us this piece of artwork here. We're going for like a quilted pattern, something way more like elegant looking. Definitely a step up from the best I could do before, which was just kind of this roughly textured thing. I love these. I'm not like talking trash about them, but I think we could do a little bit more, a little bit more something, right? That said, in order to make sure all of my design is going to fit into that leather, I first kind of drew it out onto the cardboard of my template. This also gives me a place to measure against with my wing divider so I can transpose those markings from that design onto my leather. So here's how that works. After we've wet the leather and got it ready to take a mark, we take that wing divider and line it up on the lines we wanna draw on the template, and then use it as a guide all around the edge to make sure our border is that same width. Then we simply go back to the template and change the size of the wing dividers to match the next line and do the same thing. Doing this, I was able to take all of those border lines and get them on my leather exactly where they needed to go. Little things like this are definitely stuff that like I came up with later on as I was going. And it saves so much time instead of trying to measure and then like make your lines where they need to be. No, I just draw it out first and then I have my little tools there that make it easier. Okay, so with those lines in place, the next step is to take my swivel knife and just cut them in. And because this is a thicker piece of leather, I'm actually cutting it in a little more deeply. Doing that will just give me more room to work with, and when I bevel those in, it'll make that design pop out just a little bit more. Speaking of beveling, the next step, of course, is going back around those lines with my beveler stamp and just insetting them a little bit to make all of those features seem to pop out. Don't notice that little bit of like a rippling effect in my stamp? 
I'm gonna talk about a trick that I actually just learned on this project in just a little bit with that one. But for now, it's been like the bane of my existence. I've just, I've always been bad at leaving like uneven marks when I try that shading. But speaking of stamps, I wanna introduce you to kind of the flare pieces we're gonna be putting on this thing. For the actual like large border trim, I got this kind of square leaf pattern stamp here that's gonna fill in that space nicely. Then I also have these elegant leafy designs as well that are gonna mark out my corners. These are super easy to use. You just use your mallet to stamp them where you want them and then just move it over one step, lining it up with the last stamp and making another mark. And then again, I use those more elegant designs for my corners. Since that pattern are these like large squares, I'd either have to like pass it through and then restart again or whatever. It just, it wouldn't look right. But I really like this little design. I think it turned out super slick. I like that that border pattern's kind of understated. It's like an extra detail. I think that's one of the main things I've learned over time is having a lot of tiny little detail layers. So the closer you get to a thing, the more it kind of pops out at you and has interest. Now, when doing a lot of these projects, I try to keep in mind the fact that not everybody has like a workshop and all these tools to work with. In fact, for a long time, I did everything out of my apartment with the amount of tools that could fit just inside of a tiny tool chest under my bed. And though it can feel really limiting, that's how you build up your skill. By rolling up your sleeves and learning how to make do with the bare minimum. And luckily for you, I found a class on today's sponsor, Skillshare, that is all about making a workspace for yourself with the smallest amount of stuff possible. In Woodworking, How to Build a Micro Workshop, Ovindi Lai Jacobson not only shows you how to build a tiny little workshop, but also walks you through how to use it to build your own projects. I'm not gonna lie, the biggest reason I'm showing it to you isn't the sponsorship. I love this concept. I encourage you to check it out, not only to maybe do what he does there, but then come up with like your own micro workshop. If you do or you have some like cool ideas on how to do that, why don't you leave it down in the comment section below. I'd love to hear what you guys come up with. And if that kind of thing doesn't really interest you, no worries. Skillshare has classes on a huge variety of topics, including illustration, graphic design, photography, entrepreneurship. And if you wanna unlock your creativity or learn something new, you're in luck, cause Skillshare has a deal for this community. The first 500 people to click on the link below will get one month free of Skillshare. Seriously though, at least go check out that tiny workshop thing. I really like that idea, that's so cool. Okay, so as it shows in the artwork here, we really wanted to have kind of like a quilted design, almost like a gambeson has. Now in order to make that design, all I did was lay a ruler down at an angle and trace it out with my awl. Then I simply move that ruler over one step, lining it back up with the line I just drew and trace it again. I simply follow this all the way down to the end and then reposition my ruler to start making diamonds going the other way, just crisscrossing. The key here is though, to make sure that your ruler is at kind of an extreme angle. So not like right up and down and not all the way at like a 45, but kind of right in between the two of those. Doing that is gonna make you end up with these tall diamonds rather than just kind of squares. Which as you can see here, even just scratched in, have a really cool look. But then when I go back over them with my swivel knife and really cut them into place, you really start to see how cool this look is. Now to add more texture and layer to this whole thing, I just re-wet that leather and then go back in with my bevel stamp, chasing those lines up one side and then turning it around and following it around the other side as well. Basically, we want the diamonds on like either side. So we're like two diamonds are gonna meet each other for both of them to kind of mound down. So in order to do that, we need to go on both sides of that line with our bevel tool and kind of push that space down. By doing this along every single line, it leaves us with this really nice quilted texture that really makes every one of those bits look like they're sticking out, which is gonna be great because we're gonna really try to drive this quilted texture home by adding some stitches to it. Though again, I found that I had that little ripple texture that was happening while I was stamping that drives me crazy. But then I remembered something from when I was actually a contractor like way back in the day. And that's basically just letting the tool do the work for you. So like if you're trying to saw something, you don't push down on the saw, you just let the saw teeth do what it's doing. So instead of actually trying to, to hit every single time, I instead focused on just bringing the hammer back up and then letting it drop its own weight down. And I'm gonna tell you what, this completely changed the game for me. So not only was I not like getting the fatigue after like long time tooling, because there's a lot of lines to tool and a lot of pieces. If I'm trying to push down into it, I started getting tired over time. Not only just in this hand, but the hand that was holding it because you're always trying to like keep it right and you're fighting against your own little mishits or whatever. But by just letting the weight of the hammer do the work, I'm just bringing it up and I'm letting it fall back down. 
By doing that, I'm able to go faster, first of all. And the pressure it's putting into it is just the pressure of gravity. It's exactly whatever weight, whatever mass this is being pulled down by gravity, exactly the same every single time. What was causing that wavy pattern is because I'm not consistent with my own little musculature, I'm hitting it a little harder, a little weaker, and that's causing differences in height, which makes that little bit of a ripple pattern. But look at the difference here. Look at how smooth this one is compared to the other one. Almost all of those little ripples are gone. I hope that makes sense. To me, it was like a revelation. It was so much easier too, because I'm not like trying to strike a damn thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's the little things. I like little tips like that, that's neat. But now we're really starting to get somewhere. Look at how cool this is gonna look when it's all put together. Like we still got a ways to go, but I was already really excited by that. Okay, from here, we're gonna tackle something that has also always been troublesome for me, and that's adding different colors to one piece. Have y'all seen one piece? Ah, <sighs> so good. All right, ADHD, back, back. All right, so when I'm trying to add these different colors to a single piece, the the issue is that that uh, leather likes to bleed dye, right? If you don't, if you're not careful with how you're putting dye into place, it'll bleed into spots that you don't want it to go to. So one of the things I've learned, especially with more detail, is using kind of a bigger brush, either kind of a fatter brush that goes off into a point like this one, or a longer brush. But you basically want it to first hold a fair amount of dye which is counterintuitive because it's gonna let a lot more die down, right? But if you have to keep going back and forth with a smaller brush, every time you get that new dip, the first time you touch it is gonna be the maximum amount of dye that's gonna fall. And you wanna do that as few times as possible because then you wanna control the dye after it's down. If you have to keep doing that, you're constantly like out of control and racing those big puddles of dye. So for example, when I'm doing this line here, I basically push the brush down in the middle of that feature and then try to consistently bring that line across, knowing it's gonna bleed out towards the sides. By putting it in the middle of that little feature, I, I let it bleed out towards the sides a little bit, knowing it'll run out before it actually gets to the parts I don't want it to cover. And then I can go back in and drag that die out to right where I want it. This just gives me a whole lot more control and gets everything done way more nicely. Now for the middle, we're using this nice show brown die and I'm bringing it as close to the edges as I can like get away with using a dauber. Then again, I go back in with a paintbrush and bring it up as close to the edge as I can. Also notice with this, another little dyeing trick that you don't want to use that brush and go in straight lines, right? Like I know all that's left are straight lines, so you'd think just fill in that space. But you're going to see that. The dye is going to dry in those ways and you're going to see little straight lines. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually putting it down and then I'm doing little circles and feathering it back into the rest of the dye. That's going to make it disappear so you don't see those lines around the edges. I always did that wrong. Cool, once I'm happy with that, the rest of the design called for like a golden trim. To make that happen, I'm gonna use this paint that I found that's specifically designed for leather and has a really nice gold finish. Using a brush, I just kind of put this into place, again, bringing it as close to that blue trim as I can. And look at how slick this comes out, it is so nice. The first time I used that paint was making the cleric book here, and I remember thinking then too, like, that's really sweet. And again, it's made for leather, so it will like flex and stretch without chipping away. Now, as pretty as that looks, it looks very plastic to me right now, right? Like the gold is too shiny and the the brown and the blue, like they're, they're too cartoonishly perfect to me. I don't want something to look like Fisher Price. It looks like a toy, right? You need to like mellow all those colors out a little bit, add depth to everything. And the perfect thing to do that is an antique gel like I got here. I think this one's like an antique paste. Oh, I have it right here. Antique finish. This one's more of a paste than a gel. But basically what you do with this stuff is you just kind of, you rub it on top of everything, making sure it gets into all the little nooks and crannies, and then you quickly wipe it away. All of that gel, that darker color gets stuck down into the recesses, making them look deeper and brings that detail out. It also mellows out all of the other colors. Look at the difference between the gold on one side and the gold on the other. Just gives it a lot more depth and just kind of makes it look more real, to me at least. So I was feeling this thing and I really wanted to give it just like an, a little extra niceness, so I decided to treat those edges. What I'm using here is stuff called Edge Coat and it's just almost like a, like a paint or like a rubberized, protective surface that goes on it and protects those corners. It's really nice stuff. It adds a super clean look and it dries very fast. Now, as much as I have learned uh, and as much better as I am like doing leather stuff, I'm gonna tell you, man, I still make like little stupid mistakes. 
And this one killed me. So look at the blue line on one of them. And on the other one, I completely forgot to put down that blue border. I got all the way to this point, painting it and dyeing it and everything, without noticing that I left out that, like, <laughs> killed me. But I was too far, and I don't like to waste leather. So I'm like, how am I going to make this match so it looks better and it won't drive me crazy? So, to get around it, I decided to add a couple of other elements that will give us that blue pop. Starting with this little badge here. I made these with my leather engraver. Actually, I made a bunch of them. It's basically you take like a, like a masking tape, a big sheet of masking tape, and you stick it on the leather, and then you let the laser burn around it so it doesn't mark the clean leather. And then I'm left with these like little belt favors that I can give to you guys. But I figured we could probably use this and make some sort of like an insignia or shield that'll sit on top. To make it match though, I first filled in that whole tree in the borderline section with my gold paint. I then went around the I then went around the edge with my blue to tie that whole thing together. And you see once I remove the tape, how good that looks. It's so slick. Though my dumbass forgot to press record again, I also added the brown dye into it as well. Just taking my paintbrush and getting all like in between the branches of the tree and whatnot. It would have been incredibly tedious to watch. Oh, you're welcome, I guess. Now, as I said before, some of the real beauty here is going to be in the details. And I wanted, again, to make that look like it was quilted, almost like gambeson material. So to really drive that home, I decided that in between every one of those little like diamond marks, I'm going to add stitches. You can for sure do this by hand if, you know, you hate your life or you just really love sewing. But I'm using my new sewing machine that I got from Tandy here to get this done quickly. Pretty easy, all I did was follow those lines, just making sure the thread fell right in between you where you'd expect it to go if it was actually quilted. I then went around the entire outside of it with some gold thread just to add some extra pop and again, further tie the whole thing together. I used that same gold thread, by the way, to put on my little, my little tree icon there. And look at how good this looks. Like, damn, I'm, <laughs> I'm really proud of that, right? There's little things that'll happen every once in a while. You make it and you step back and you're like, I made that. That's awesome. That's my favorite part about this process and about like us leveling up these skills because you start with something that is like really basic, right? Like this is just a bunch of pieces of leather that I kind of strapped together and it's good and I like it. But then you see like when you level up and what you're capable of, oh man, it just makes me real proud. I'm real happy about it. And look at all of them together. Oh, it's so sexy, damn it. Okay, so again, I really want to duplicate this little armadillo slinky design I got going on here. And that's predicated completely on me making these little straps to hold everything together. But notice how much bigger the top straps here have to be and how much kind of excess material there is. That, I remember it taking me a long time to figure out because I was laying everything flat. But when you actually put it around, as you can see like in this one here more clearly, it takes up way more space when it's kind of filling in that three-dimensional area. And figuring that out whilst it was flat was kind of a pain. In fact, it isn't perfect. I think I made it a little too big because every once in a while, you'll see how like the under underneath one comes outside. So before I make those straps for this one, I wanted to shape them the way they're going to be. Shape them so they'll fit around my arm and have this kind of rounded shape to them. Luckily, leather loves to be shaped. All I had to do was take a wet sponge and moisten the back side of it. Once it was good and moist, I put it into position and then used a ribbon to tie it into shape. Then after giving it a couple hours and I untied that ribbon, it stays perfectly how I wanted it. Look at that, it's pretty slick, right? I love that leather does that, it's so cool. But if you really want to like go to town and make this like armor armor, you can harden the leather too by doing kind of a similar process. You'd have to really soak the leather and then bake it or you put it into some like melted wax. We'll go over that some other time. But now that I have that shape how I need it, I basically lay them all out how they'll go and mark them with a pencil so that I know if they move out of, out of position. Then I made these straps here with holes punched in them right where they'd land on each piece of leather. Then I simply punched some holes through the corners on each one of those panels and riveted them all into place using these round top rivets here. Doing that connects them all together and gives me that little slinky mobility action that I'm looking for. Knowing those all work together, it was easy to lay them back into place so that I can lock in the last two pieces right where they go. And look at that, look at how cool that is. That's exactly what I want it to do. Not only that, but it drapes and falls and goes around my arm exactly how I want it. I am over the moon with how good this is coming out. 
Okay, so home stretch. Now we just need a way to actually attach it to ourselves, right? So to make the first connection points where it'll kind of go around my chest here, I actually made these little strips that I had painted and dyed to match that'll act as a keeper for the D-ring here. Just simply looping around it and then getting riveted into place. These I tacked with a single rivet on the edges of the top plate. And I discovered with this one here, having that single rivet attachment point is actually really crucial because you want this to be able to move. You want it to be able to kind of mold and, and go the direction you want to go. If it was stuck, if this strap was act like hard stuck on here, it would cross me awkwardly or if I changed my outfit or had other things I was wearing that it got in the way, it couldn't adjust itself around me comfortably. Now for the actual straps, I first needed one that would fit around my bicep to hold it there. For these, I made this simple buckle here, along with about a 10 inch strap to go with it. These I just tacked into place on the corner of the bottom most plate so that I can attach it to my arm. For the bit that goes across my chest here and holds the shoulder into place, I just made a longer belt. Again, one side with a buckle, the other side with all the little holes in it. But on the ends of this one, I put these tiny hooks into place. Just little snap hooks, super easy to do. But this way, once you get it like buckled in the size you like it to be, I can then just unsnip it here and then it'll always be kind of exactly how I want it. I don't have to fiddle with that buckle. Not only that, but you could remove those if you end up like making chest armor that has actual connection points built into it. Then you don't even need that strap, right? You can actually connect it right to your, your actual armor. With these all connected though, it was ready to try out. And oh my God, I love it. I love it so much. It fits perfectly. It gives me the mobility I need. Oh, and it looks so good. Like, look at it. Oh, I love it so much. I like, I'm, I'm pulling off like a, like a holiday barbarian right now. I will split your skull after my hot cocoa is done. I love the little, the little symbol here. Oh, it's so great. And I leave it up to you, like, have I increased enough? Look at the difference between where I, the first kind of attempt at this and then my next one. I love them both. I love my first one. I've been wearing it for a while now and it, it's always worked great. And this one, like the, the extra detail, I love all of the little thread work here. Like every little layer that goes into it, it's just, I'm very happy with it. I'm extremely happy. Let me know in the comment section below what you think. Do you like how this came out? Would you have done something different? What would you have added to it? I'm super excited about this. So at the beginning of the episode, I talked about these awesome costumes that Berg Snyder's releasing and how you could win some fabulous prizes. Now you might recall when I was making this kind of pouch of the bard here, that I was wearing one of their early release costumes from Call to Arms, which is Berg Snyder's official D&D licensed costume line. And we also got to show these off while we were in Comic-Con. Now they've officially released the first four costumes, which is the cleric, the fighter, the rogue, and the wizard. And with those, they've given our community a 15% discount down in the description. But wait, there's more! Because they've also given you a bunch of ways to win some prizes. Now listen up, because there is a bunch of chances to win. First of all, we're going to be picking a first place, second place, and third place winner for each one of those costumes. And like contests we've had in the past, all you have to do is get those and then make it your own somehow. Add on like fun pieces of armor like we just made or whatever your character might have. Make your own original character and then use the link in the description below to send that in. All those first place winners will get $150 through Berg Snyder. The second place winner is 75 and the third place winner is 50. But clever, I don't have the time or the skills or the tools to play with outfits like that. No problem because there's yet more ways to win. If you go to some sort of event like a con or a rent or really anything wearing one of these outfits, take a picture and post it on social media with the hashtag call to arms, you'll be automatically entered to win $100. The same if you take a picture dressed up like this playing D&D with your friends. That's another $100. There's a lot of different ways to win. We'll leave a link to it down in the description below so you can check it out. And seriously, the prices are really good on these things anyways. And with our 15% discount, I think you're really going to like it. They were a super hit at the Comic-Con. So pick your class and create your story. Adventure starts here. I think I'm going to be going with the fighter. Look at how cool this is. As a base? Oh, it's so good. I can't wait. Now, if you liked what you saw here today, why don't you give me some of that like and love and don't forget to subscribe so you know when I release new content. In the meantime, though, keep leveling up, you. You've made it to the end screen. YouTube loves it when you do that. It's a fantastic way to support this channel. Another fantastic way to support this channel is by joining these people's noble ranks. These are our Patreon members, and honestly, we can't do any of this without you. Special thanks to our newest high-tier Patreon members, Kriegs and Dane Wetley. 
Again, it just means everything to us that you like what we do here enough to support us, and it really does go a long way to making this channel better. If you like what we do here and like to support us, consider joining our Patreon, link in the description below. Otherwise, you can click on one of these videos here that YouTube thinks you'd like, and that really helps out too. I'm just gonna lovingly stroke my armor while you decide. Mm, this isn't weird. This isn't weird.